Hello, and welcome to the launch of the ATI's latest UK Aerospace Technology Strategy, Destination Zero. It's a great pleasure to be with you here this morning, and I hope you will enjoy everything that we talk about um, this morning. So much has happened since our last strategy across, across aviation and in terms of technology development and innovation. The focus on sustainability has increased and the speed of technology development has brought forward new opportunities. All of that is reflected in our market-led strategy that you will hear about today. You will see that the focus is on three main themes, zero emission, building on and incorporating on the Fly Zero project, which we completed in March, ultra-efficient technologies and cross-cutting agendas. Throughout this morning, you will hear more detail on all of these themes and their detailed roadmaps. As you will see, many of the technologies outlined are applicable to many sectors, with aerospace taking a lead in their development, ultimately providing huge commercial and economic spillover within the economy. It's also, exact, also exciting to have the announcement of the funding extension and programme reopening to coincide and help fund many of the technologies outlined within the document. The overall joint commitment to fund aerospace research and development in the UK is now extended from 2026 to 2031, and an additional 685 million of government funding has been provided for the next three years. Obviously, when matched by industry, that is over a billion pounds worth of additional research and development investment. The ATI programme is now open for new applicants, and we are currently accepting expressions of interest for the latest competition. So if you have a, an interest, I would encourage you to engage early in the process with the ATI, uh, and we look forward to that engagement um, after this. Before I finish, I just wanted to say a, a massive thank you both to the ATI team, but also to our advisory groups. So several hundred individuals and experts from across industry and academia have provided inputs to this document, and that gives it great strength and credibility. And I thank you for your time and effort. So last to say, good luck. Um, please enjoy the rest of the session today. And I thank you for listening. Goodbye. Well, good morning, everybody. This is Simon Weeks. Uh, I'm the Chief Technology Officer of the Aerospace Technology Institute. And it's a great privilege to be here, um, actually to introduce, uh, it's my fourth time, uh, introducing the ATI's technology strategy. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, get into it. Um, so here you can see the cover, and I, I do hope that many of you have already downloaded your copy, uh, which was up on our website this morning. Um, what I'm going to do is give you a, a, a brief top level overview of the strategy, uh, step through the, the main uh, elements of it, uh, and then allow some of my colleagues to take you through some of the uh, detail. Um, so uh, right at the top level, it's going to set out the uh, core of the ATI program, defines our priorities, sets our objectives and quantifies our impact. And if you think about the impact of uh, the ATI, we've been going eight years now. Um, we committed almost four billion of joint government and industry funding into well over 300, pro uh, well over 300 projects. And um, it's some real visible impact uh, on the aerospace scene uh, with infrastructure right across the country and the manufacturing technology centers and out in industry and academia as well. And ATI uh, funded projects have been flying as well, which has been tremendously exciting. And that, that's a, a huge development since our last strategy. So onto the key strategic objectives. So at, right at the top, uh, what we're setting out is to ensure that the UK remains a leader uh, and is a leader for the future net zero aerospace world. Uh, and the key, uh, obviously, central part of the ATI is accelerating technologies uh, to deliver net zero carbon uh, in the future and targeted that for 2050. And then underneath it all, obviously, we're uh, as much uh, trying to ensure that the UK uh, industry is competitive uh, to meet uh, the ever more com competitive world uh, that we will live in. So uh, drivers for change, what's, what's driving things? So firstly, uh, we're all aware we need to take bigger risks than before um, to underpin the clean technology growth for aviation. And we're, we're jumping out into areas of technology uh, that are entirely new. Uh, 
overall uh, aircraft efficiency will continue to drive sustainability, it always makes sense uh, to make your aircraft more energy efficient, uh, irrespective of the energy source that you're using, be it uh, kerosene like sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable uh, fuels or uh, hydrogen or batteries. Um, sustainable aviation fuels production and usage will uh, expand rapidly. There are already major projects underway across the world to, to uh, deliver that, uh, including in the UK. And then disruptive technologies such as hydrogen and battery power will enable zero carbon commercial flight. Uh, in putting together our strategy, one of the things we've done is, is updated our view of the future aerospace market. And um, our Fly Zero project has, has also enabled us to give a real vision into what might happen on zero carbon emission platforms. And you can see here, it's quite a simple view of our uh, scenario that we built into the thinking for the strategy. Um, the top line numbers, um, there's an opportunity up to 2050 of 4.3 trillion uh, for the whole industry globally. And our view is that the UK could grow its market share from 13% to nearly 18% by 2050 uh, if it's in right at the start and, and right in developing the future zero carbon emission platforms. Uh, we've already heavily invested in what we call ultra efficient platforms, and those are uh, really on the cusp of coming to fruition. Uh, and if we successfully play in both uh, those areas, ultra efficient and zero carbon, uh, we've got a great opportunity into the future. And you can see how that maps out into, into time. Um, and as we all know, uh, the industry now is, is just starting to come out one of the worst recessions it's ever seen, thanks to COVID-19. Uh, but we do anticipate um, a really exciting future for the industry with new platforms uh, starting to be uh, come into service from around the turn of this uh, decade. This is a really important chart, and, and this has been derived from some of the extensive modeling work uh, that ATI have undertaken over the last few years, uh, both modeling and extending out um, the art of the possible for conventional aircraft powered by SAF, uh, and then looking into the future and the opportunities offered by uh, hydrogen fuel. Uh, and what you can see is if you stack that up and, and project um, our view of emissions out to 2050, um, you need to do everything. You need to do SAF, you need to do hydrogen. Um, SAF is quite a challenge. We think only about half of it uh, is going to come from uh, 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 bio sources. Uh, and so that means the challenge is to produce another half of that requirement uh, from fully synthetic sources. So um, some big challenges out there, but uh, I think people are starting to get to, to grips with some of those challenges now. Uh, but you can see that we need to do absolutely everything um, to get towards our target of net zero carbon emissions uh, by 2050. So the urgent sector challenges going forward, uh, we need to accelerate the new technologies coming forward for more sustainable aircraft entering service really from uh, towards the end of this decade. Uh, there must be policies and incentives uh, to support those more sustainable aircraft, uh, particularly um, policies and incentives around the introduction of SAF and hydrogen as well. Industrial airport infrastructures for SAF and hydrogen both uh, require fairly significant investment, and particularly hydrogen going forward um, to produce it and, and to be able to use it at airports. And then to bring through new regulations and standards for new technologies uh, is equally important. Another key aspect for us is well, what's the ATI scope? Uh, because we have many, many exciting projects always coming towards us. And th th there are limits to uh, the sort of thing that we are able to focus on. And so um, what we'd hoped in this diagram, and this is in the strategy, is to ensure that we're much clearer on ATI scope. Um, so to be clear, everything that's within scope is within 
that circle that says ATI aircraft technology scope and rather simply it's everything that flies that's carrying people uh, so you can see right from VTOL and eVTOL up through sub-regional, regional, through into the narrow bodies and then the wide bodies. Uh, and of course, as we know, uh, most of the emissions today come from the narrow body and wide body fleets uh, across the world. Uh, and so uh, you know, that's a real priority for us to, to um, address that uh, issue. Uh, so onto the technology priorities within that. So uh, Gary has already talked about these terms, the zero carbon aircraft technologies. This is, these are the sort of technologies envisaged by the Fly Zero project that's just successfully completed. Uh, at the same time, we've been working now for many years in the ATI, bringing through what we call the ultra efficient aircraft technologies, uh, particularly the ultra efficient, highly aerodynamically efficient, lightweight wing structures uh, of the future, uh, highly efficient uh, uh, jet engine propulsion systems, and then highly efficient, uh, all, the, all the other systems that uh, go onto the aircraft, making those as lightweight and energy efficient as possible. Uh, underneath all those go uh, what we call the cross-cutting technologies and infrastructure. Uh, that's things like the key experimental infrastructure you need to develop technologies for zero carbon aircraft and ultra efficient aircraft. Uh, and uh, the sort of digital modeling technologies, um, the through life uh, support service uh, technologies and so on to keep fleets flying. Uh, so uh, that uh, encompasses, you know, in a nutshell, the, the three top priority areas for us. And, um, And for each of those uh, areas you will find in the strategy, uh, there is a high level roadmap. And um, it's here that we've been extremely grateful uh, for the contribution of our working groups. Uh, and uh, many of you will have been involved in a large virtual workshop uh, earlier on this year that we've used and, and distilled um, all the discussions out of that. And it was a great uh, session. Um, uh, to produce that output uh, that you see today. What I'm not going to do is go through that in detail. Um, we're going to start to discuss that in a little bit more detail later this morning, uh, but also in the weeks and months to come uh, as we uh, communicate uh, really quite comprehensive out across the country through a series of regional roadshows through to the Farnborough Air Show and beyond, um, you will get to understand a lot more of that detail. So uh, on to the conclusions. Uh, so at, at the top, zero carbon aircraft technologies have got the largest carbon reduction potential and also market opportunity for UK. Uh, remember, we, we've got a, an opportunity as big as 18% of the global market, but that's only if we can bring through those zero carbon aircraft technologies. So we need to accelerate those. Uh, the ultra efficient aircraft technologies of wings, of propulsion systems and onboard aircraft systems uh, we need to complete the delivery of those now to TRL6. We've been working on them uh, for a number of years now. Uh, I'm really excited that we're going to start to see um, some of those run for the first time. Uh, hopefully this year uh, we'll see the ultra high bypass ratio engine uh, run uh, and hopefully fly over the next five years. Uh, and then also the um, future uh, composite wing technologies. We'll, we'll start to see the prototype wings uh, being assembled over the next five years or so. So really exciting times. Um, both um, sustainable aviation fuels and hydrogen, uh, as we've seen, are vital to net zero carbon by 2050. Uh, those need to be scaled up. Um, we don't see that uh, fuels and hydrogen production uh, and infrastructure are central to ATI, but we will work with the groups across the country and internationally uh, to do our bit to encourage the scale up uh, of those uh, and all that is required to deliver this uh, net zero carbon future. And then finally, cross-cutting technologies uh, are also vital for novel aircraft platforms and future UK technical leadership uh, for aerospace. So uh, we need to ensure that we're continuing to focus development in the right areas there uh, to support our, our zero carbon aircraft and ultra efficient aircraft going forwards. 
so I'm now going to hand you over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Alejandro Block, uh, and he's going to tell you a little bit more detail about the sustainability modeling that we've done. Uh, I hope that um, uh, that's been clear to you, uh, the presentation I've given to you. Uh, do look through the strategy and I'll look forward to uh, talking a little bit later this morning uh, and then hopefully seeing most of you out on the road over the next few months uh, as we take the uh, messages in the strategy forwards. Good morning. My name is Alejandro Block. I'm a senior technology in uh, strategy, sustainability and integration, and I will present the zero carbon emission aircraft technology roadmap. When we uh, wrote our technology strategy, we had to make scenarios uh, to be able to quantify uh, the different pathways to be able to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Within this scenario, we include the introduction, the entry into service of both zero carbon and ultra efficient aircraft. Uh, both of these aircraft are underpinned by enabling technologies, uh, which are cross-cutting by nature. So this roadmap tells the story of the zero-carbon aircraft and how we can have a specific technology programs and milestones that will allow us to bring this aircraft into service by approximate time, time frames. So we can see those aircraft here at the top, and we have a sub-regional EVTOL or VTOL aircraft powered by batteries. We have a fuel cell aircraft uh, regional with gaseous hydrogen. Then we have an evolution of that, which is a fuel cell aircraft regional, but with liquid hydrogen storage, which can potentially fly for longer ranges. And then we have a gas turbine powered aircraft, again with liquid hydrogen storage. So if we manage to bring this uh, platforms into service at approximate uh, those, those timelines, we will be able to achieve some specific targets, which you can see on the bottom right of, of the screen here. So for example, from now until 2050, we estimate that we will be able to avoid around 0 0.7 gigatons of carbon dioxide to be emitted uh, by the introduction of this aircraft. In the year 2050, about 8% of the emissions will have been avoided by zero carbon aircraft. And this will grow considerably over time uh, as these aircraft start penetrating the fleet and replacing kerosene burning airplanes. Both uh, battery powered aircraft and fuel cell aircraft will eliminate NOx emissions completely. And we expect that aircraft powered by hydrogen gas turbines will considerably reduce NOx emissions. So we expect uh, at least a 90% reduction in NOx uh, and also a reduction in, in noise by 2050. All of this together uh, will create a market value of around 0 0.6 trillion pounds from now until 2050. And the UK could potentially be getting 19% of that market share. Uh, if uh, 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 an introduction of the aircraft into service follows the the pathway we have up here, and that could enable 60,000 aerospace jobs just on the zero carbon aircraft. So, how do we bring this aircraft into service, and and what are the milestones that we need to achieve? That is the core of the roadmap, and and this is what you can see here in the middle of the screen, and that is divided into different storylines. So we have the propulsion and power storyline. Then we have the advanced system storyline and the aerostructures storyline. The propulsion and power one is itself divided into three streams. So we have the liquid hydrogen and gas turbine story. Then we have the hydrogen fuel cell propulsion story and the battery one. So as we move from left to right, we can see how the technologies will have to be developed over time to be able to deliver the specific aircraft platforms that we see above. An example of that for the gas turbine powered aircraft is we have to start combusting hydrogen uh, in a single combustion sector. So we envision that we will have a, a test first with one single sector, moving into a full annular combustor, which has to deliver low NOx emissions. That will have to be integrated then into an engine ground demonstrator 
that will further be integrated into an airplane to fly and have a flying demonstrator. Uh, and that will then move on to having a full aircraft uh, demonstrator, which is powered by hydrogen entirely. Uh, in the same way, the hydrogen fuel cell story shows us a, a pathway that we start with a low temperature, low power fuel cell systems uh, being tested on the ground with a powertrain and then tested on flight uh, and then integrated with a liquid hydrogen storage system and so on. So, so the, different, the, the, the different pathways from left to right describe the different stories of how we can bring this aircraft into service and what are some of the milestones that we might need to achieve for that. If I move on to the advanced systems, we have two main storylines. One is the hydrogen storyline, and these are the milestones related specifically to hydrogen airplanes. Uh, so we have things like sensing. We, we know we will require sensing to be able to detect, for example, hydrogen leakage, to detect temperatures, etc. Uh, liquid hydrogen tanks, so cryogenic tanks, which we envision being metallic in the first generation, and further ahead, here we might have a second generation of composite tanks. In the middle of, as well, we have heat exchanging technologies. Uh, we have uh, fuel and hydraulic systems for ground demonstrator. And the story tells us how all of these systems will end up integrating into a full assembled aircraft. On the other hand, we have the cross-cutting systems. And these are systems which are applicable to both the hydrogen uh, or the zero carbon and the ultra efficient aircraft. So these cross-cutting systems that you see here in red you will see them again in the ultra efficient roadmap because they are cross cutting and, and applicable to both platforms. They involve things like next generation cabin systems, integrated antenna with structures to reduce drag, next generation of cyber secure avionics, um, low weight and low cost uh, landing gears, systems to reduce, uh, to, to enable reduced crew operations, etc. Et and then at the bottom, we have the aero structures storyline and in here what we are acknowledging is that handling and using liquid hydrogen uh, and gaseous hydrogen in an airplane is going to be considerably different to dealing with kerosene so we have milestones related to the material properties for high temperature and cryogenic applications sealing systems and technologies that will be quite different to what we have today we have multifunctional structures that can for example serve a, a structural purpose as well as be uh, used for heat management or, or thermal management. Uh, we also acknowledge that the storage systems uh, for the fuel will be different. So we will have dry wings that we will need to be demonstrated both in functionality and in aerodynamic properties. So in this way, this, this roadmap tells us some of the specific milestones that we will require to be able to uh, bring this aircraft into service uh, and achieve the CO2 emission reductions that we expect along with the market value. The technology benefits for the aerospace sector, both in terms of the economic potential and the potential to reach net zero emissions, will be maximized through the delivery of this zero carbon aircraft and the ultra efficient aircraft that will have to be uh, enabled to run on 100% SAF. This will only be able to be delivered through the enabling technologies that you will see presented in the cross-cutting roadmap. In this way, uh, it really is the synergy between these three roadmaps that has the potential to take us to net zero. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, my name is Mark Scully and I'm the Head of Technology for Advanced Systems and Propulsion at the Aerospace Technology Institute. In this session, I'll introduce the Ultra-Efficient Aircraft Technology Roadmap, which is one of the three roadmaps in our latest technology strategy, Destination Zero, the Technology Journey to 2050. So by way of introduction, ultra-efficient technologies are focused on improving energy efficiency and hence impact CO2 emissions NOx and noise. Continued development of crucial high value, sustainable, high productivity manufacturing technologies will position the UK to be a first choice location for the industry. 
And these technologies are translatable to all market sectors and are directly deployable into later zero carbon emissions aircraft. They'll also benefit large scale aircraft that are unable to use a zero carbon fuel source. And the ATI has modeled future ultra efficient wide body and single aisle aircraft, predicting that efficiency improvements of 16% and 20% respectively can be achieved by the next generation. So what are our key priorities for ultra efficient technologies? First of all, to mature ultra high bypass ratio turbofan engines to TRL6, ensuring readiness for new commercial aircraft opportunities with entries into service from 2030 onwards. And secondly, to exploit new aerodynamic technologies and high rate manufacturing assembly of composite wings for the next generation of single aisle aircraft from 2030 and the next generation wide body aircraft from 2035. So here we are, we're now looking at the roadmap. Let's take a look at uh, the milestones at the top in terms of the aircraft concepts. So we've assumed um, some a market scenario where we see a regional ultra efficient aircraft in the late 2020s, followed by a narrow body ultra efficient aircraft around about the 2030 timeframe, and then a wide body ultra efficient aircraft by the end of the next decade. So let's move to the right hand side of the roadmap, look at the targets. We've assigned three uh, targets which are re particularly related to sustainability. First of those is a saving of 1.2 gigatons of CO2 through aircraft technological efficiency improvements between now and 2050. And then an avoidance of 9.5% of annual aviation CO2 through ultra efficient aircraft by 2050. Uh, and then, of course, 90% of NOx reduction and 65% reduction of perceived noise per aircraft by 2050 compared with year 2000 platforms. In addition to that, we've got three economic based targets. First of all, we see a £1.6 trillion global market opportunity for ultra efficient aircraft through to 2050. And the UK could potentially take up to a 15% share of the future global ultra efficient aircraft market creating 72,000 aerospace jobs on ultra efficient aircraft by 2050. So let's now move into the roadmap technologies themselves. Start with aerostructures at the bottom there. So we see lightweight, high aspect ratio, high production rate composite wings, high aspect ratio wings, which are optimized for aerodynamic efficiency and rapid assembly fully automated high rate composite wing structure components manufacture and wing assembly. So, so what does, how do we actually deliver that? So that includes things like materials and process development for near net shape, additive manufacturing and composites for high temperature applications, simulation demonstration of the industrial system for high aspect ratio wing manufacture and assembly, folding wing tips with highly integrated systems, laminar flow nacelle manufacturing technologies, and the demonstration of high rate manufacturing assembly of composite high aspect ratio wings and other structures. The introduction of load alleviation and flutter suppression technologies for high aspect ratio wings, and more laminar flow wings and aerodynamic devices. And the manufacture and assembly of ultra high accuracy highly flexible laminar wing components, torque box and assemblies. And then the introduction of highly flexible advanced wings. So we aim to achieve at least 10% efficiency improvement with over 15% weight reduction and over 10% aerodynamic improvement for the next generation of aircraft through these aerostructures technologies. Moving into systems in the middle there, Systems uh, are characterized by energy efficient, lightweight, more electric aircraft systems, which include electrical power systems, landing systems, ice and rain protection systems, fuel systems, thermal management, flight control systems, communication systems, flight deck displays and controls, environmental control systems, and cabin systems. 
So let, firstly, let's take a look at the systems technologies which are unique to ultra-efficient aircraft. And these include ultra-efficient, or ultra-lightweight, I should say, SAF-compatible fuel systems, which includes fuel management and gauging technology, advanced thermal management systems, and adaptable flight control systems for composite next-generation wings. And then we see a whole swathe of cross-cutting systems technologies, which apply equally to ultra-efficient and zero-carbon aircraft technologies. Uh, so these include next-generation cabin systems, including passenger connectivity and environmental control systems, more electric, non-propulsive electrical power systems, integrated antenna within the structures to reduce drag, next-generation cybersecure avionics technologies, including enablers for autonomy, next generation low power ice and rain protection technologies next generation low weight and cost sustainable landing systems and systems to enable reduced crew operation and finally a little bit further out we see the introduction of energy harvesting and reuse systems and sensors and then flight control systems for highly flexible wing ground test uh, scenarios so with all of those, we aim to achieve an overall efficiency improvement of up to 5%, including energy consumption and weight reduction. So now let's take a look at propulsion and power. So that's characterized by the ultra high bypass ratio turbofan with composite gear driven fan systems for high propulsive and aerodynamic efficiencies and low noise, ultra efficient high pressure Oh, sorry, high temperature cores, intelligent control and monitoring systems. So just moving away slightly from UHBR itself to support things like the regional applications that we see on there, we see the, the importance of high efficiency, low noise propeller systems. And then back in the world of UHBR, we see ground demonstration of the composite fan power gearbox, the high performance core and the low emission combustor. We see the integration between the propulsion and the uh, airframe in terms of a flight demonstration. <coughs> and we see the UHBR advanced manufacturing and assembly technologies as being crucial. And then further on, we see more highly integrated engine, the cell and pylon structures being important. And then uh, in the middle there, we can see the ultra efficient open rotor demonstrator really characterized by the activity that's led uh, through this, the CFM activity. And then further out, we can see um, continued developments of the UHBR. So we see things like the uh, variable pitch fan demonstration for the UHBR and potentially a hybrid UHBR demonstrator. So through all of those, uh, we aim to achieve over 10% over efficiency in CO2 emissions improvement by 2030, with further benefits from electrical hybridisation and variable pitch fans from 2030 onwards. So I'd like to thank you for listening, and we hope that you're now familiar with our ultra-efficient aircraft technology roadmap, and we'd like to remind you uh, that the technology benefits for the aerospace sector will be maximised through delivery of not just the ultra efficient, but really it's all three of those roadmaps in tandem. So there's the cross cutting roadmap, the zero emission uh, roadmap and this ultra efficient roadmap. And thank you very much. Hello, my name is Alex Hickson. I'm the Head of Technology for Structures, Manufacturing and Materials at the Aerospace Technology Institute. In this session, I will introduce a cross-cutting aircraft technology roadmap, which is one of three roadmaps in our latest technology strategy, Destination Zero, the technology journey to 2050. The other two ATO roadmaps for ultra-efficient aircraft technologies and zero emission aircraft define the routes to achieving net zero emissions for the aerospace sector by 2050. Cross-cutting technologies are applicable to both ultra-efficient and zero emission aircraft concepts and are translatable to all market sectors.
they provide the underpinning capabilities the UK needs to be competitive and are contributing to lightweighting or improving whole aircraft performance, supporting the means to achieving the UK sustainability as well as emissions targets. To succeed in delivery of ultra efficient and zero carbon aircraft technologies and benefit the wider platform opportunities, the UK aerospace sector needs to be at the forefront of a broad range of cross-cutting enabling technologies. Developing disruptive technology opportunities is crucial for the future of the UK aerospace industry and UK transport infrastructure. We see this happening through innovation in the sector, new entrants, startups and small businesses together with collaborations with organisations mature in other sectors. As an enabling function, success of the cross-cutting technologies within the ATI programme will be judged by our ability to meet the ultra-efficient and zero-carbon milestones. The ATI has defined targets for cross-cutting technologies to set out where we need to be for the sector to be ready for the launch of future programmes, as well as delivering into existing aircraft to maintain a world-leading position. You will see these at the bottom right of the screen. For sustainability, these are reduced energy usage through lower energy materials and more efficient, robust material processing methods. Improved material utilization, moving as close as technically possible to net shape manufacturing. Reduced in-process waste, increased waste recycling, as well as end of life repair, reuse and recycling. No specific values have been defined at this time as there is some work to do to establish standards for measurement and baselines for existing materials and processes to quantify improvements for new technologies. For economics, the targets are reduced time and cost from design and production will secure UK competitiveness for a share of up to 18% of £4.3 trillion potential global market from 2022 to 2050. By 2050, the combined benefits of successfully developing technologies in cross-cutting roadmap will grow the annual GBA for the UK aerospace sector to £34 billion and growing to nearly 150,000 jobs, 33,000 more than today. Critical milestones have been defined as three key technology industrialisation phases due to the diverse group of technologies in this roadmap. The achievement of TRL or MRL6 technology validation leading into industrialization of selected technologies and capabilities to position the UK to win work share as well as integrate into legacy products and supporting services. Increase in UK share for platform opportunities through technology development that the ATI can support by working with the sector and invest in the right technologies across the value chain linked to end users. Industrialization of selected technologies and capabilities demonstrating equipment and process robustness at rate, de-risk through the ITI program, UK ecosystem in industrial organizations. The icons on the roadmap define key technology themes on a notional timeline moving from left to right to be matured, ready to deliver the required capabilities for the ultra efficient aircraft and zero emission aircraft, as well as supporting legacy platforms for the UK to remain competitive. Technologies for the cross scaling roadmap you see on the left fall into three categories, design and validation, manufacturing and assembly, and through life support. For design and validation to be competitive, designing, developing and optimising ever more complex stru structures, propulsion and systems for future platforms in what will be a compressed design cycle, the UK needs to have leading capabilities in advanced modelling and simulation tools. These should be capabilities from alternative energy aircraft in their respective systems, propulsion and aerostructures, covering materials, process and defect modelling analysis. Integrated multi-physics, multi-fidelity based modelling and simulation for future design solutions will be developed 
together with tools and capabilities for enabling greater use of determinate assembly. These shall evolve to enable more virtual and validation and verification. Further development of aerodynamic and acoustic simulation tools will be required for airframe and propulsion systems alongside design analysis for next generation aerostructures and systems. Infrastructure should also be required for future wind tunnel and heat management test rigs. The development of robust resource and energy efficient material and processes for high rate sustainable manufacturing integrated into digitally connected supply chain. Finally, digital technologies will become increasingly important from digital thread in products and supply chain to introduction of quantum computing into engineering analysis. For manufacturing and assembly, high accuracy and affordable metrology systems are required to feed into design studies and future assembly concepts. The precision and strict quality standards required by aerospace shall drive in-process monitoring control advanced metrology and non-destructive evaluation technologies to provide data to increase process robustness and support moving to reduced inspection. Further development of high-rate composite infrastructure for deposition, cure and inspection together with smart, adaptable tooling solutions need to be developed in the UK. Technical, commercial and trade selling models be required to support technology down selection to focus UK investments on the composite and metallic materials and process technologies that OEMs will certify for their aircraft. The UK needs to create capability for affordable, adaptable and intelligent automated manufacturing and assembly systems together with connected factories across the supply chain to align with customer needs for data at high rate production and readily accommodate different products at competitive price prices and costs. Improved material sustainability through optimised material utilisation through near net shape and joining processes along with developing the next generation advanced materials. As tailpipe emissions are reduced or eliminated, the embodied emissions in the life cycle of aircraft will become more dominant, so quantifying reducing these will be more important than ever. These will develop to mature circular material processing and end of life materials. Finally, next generation high performance and sustainable metallics and composite materials should be matured for future aircraft. Lastly, through life support, inspection and repair technologies and processes shall be developed to automate and cost effectively process products and services to maximize aircraft operational availability at the lowest possible through life cost. Structural health monitoring and sensing will be integrated into future aircraft, potentially linking into enhanced through life engineering, predictive maintenance, digital twins and inspection and repair processes to provide highly effective vehicle support services. Lastly, producers will consider end of life technologies and processes part of their business models. That concludes the Cross-Cutting Technologies Roadmap. It is important to note that the technology benefits for the aerospace sector will be maximised through delivery of all three of the ATI roadmaps and can only be achieved by collaboration across the aviation ecosystem and through cross-sector partnerships. Thank you for listening and we hope you are now familiar with our Cross-Cutting Technology Roadmap. Thanks, Alex, and good morning, everyone. I'm Harry Malins, Chief Innovation Officer at the Aerospace Technology Institute. I wanted to talk about how the ATI can support the UK aerospace sector in delivering the technology strategy, including our portfolio of activities and how we'll make sure that we prioritise the right areas for support. As you know, aerospace is going through a period of significant transformation with sustainability at its heart and this represents a huge opportunity for industry. The UK's aerospace sector should be ambitious in what it seeks to achieve as we transition to net zero in aviation. There's a potential global market for the next generation of ultra efficient and zero carbon aircraft of 4.3 trillion pounds 
from 2022 to 2050, based on a moderate scenario. And we believe that there's an opportunity for UK companies to increase market share from 13% today to 18% by 2050, as was mentioned earlier. And that depends on the right enablers and having the right investment in place. And at the ATI, we're also being ambitious in terms of how we can support the sector. Gary mentioned earlier the excellent news about the programme uplift, with £685 million in funding from government over the next three years and matched contributions from industry. And this is now a total programme uh, which we expect to be worth over £5.5 billion to 2031. However, there's also significant demand for that funding and we're in a position where we need to make strategic choices about how we use the resources available to us. And that's why the technology strategy is so important, as it clearly defines the priority technologies that are aligned with our zero carbon, ultra efficient and cross cutting roadmaps. We'll also be considering things like environmental impact and market potential in our decision making on future allocations for investment. And through our overall portfolio of activities, we'll be looking to support the right balance of technology readiness levels, company sizes and project risk. And to give a bit more clarity on what I mean by our portfolio of activities, these are the areas where the ATI can play a role in strengthening the UK aerospace ecosystem, in developing the best technology and in driving innovation. And these include investment in R&D, but also other areas where we can draw on our strengths, such as our sector and technical expertise, our network and our convening power to support the sector. For example, the funding uplift has enabled us to reopen the ATI's strategic programme of R&D investments. And you can find details of this on our website. Today, we have at least £200 million of committed zero emission projects. And we know that there are many more in development. And we're encouraging potential applicants to be as ambitious as possible. As well as our strategic programme, we also support small and medium enterprises through NATEP, the National Aerospace Technology Exploitation Programme. And we'll also soon be launching a new, more regular small business call. Many of you will be familiar with these programmes of investment already. And we're also supporting the transformation of aerospace in other ways. So the ATI's Fly Zero project which brought together 100 experts from across the sector for 12 months to investigate the commercial and technical feasibility of zero carbon emission flight. It, its conclusions, which were published in March, include that liquid hydrogen powered aircraft are technically feasible, will remove meaningful levels of CO2, and are forecast to have superior operating economics from around the mid 2030s. But there are some significant challenges to overcome to enable hydrogen powered flight. And we're therefore looking into establishing a directed R&D programme that would bring together industrial partners to advance the development of relevant technologies. We'll need to collaborate across the aviation ecosystem and internationally to move the Fly Zero findings forward at speed. And we're also exploring levers to support radical and disruptive innovation, both within larger, more established companies, but also in the many startups who are entering the aerospace market. And they're attracted by the significant growth opportunity in sustainable aerospace, as well as the reduced barriers to entry that are enabled by digitization and the purpose of decarbonizing flights. Other activities through which we'll strengthen the aerospace ecosystem include the development of thought leadership that addresses some of the big questions facing the sector, as well as exploring opportunities for collaboration and for partnership, including internationally, and providing advice to both government and industry on technology and innovation in line with our strategy. 
And through all of these activities, we'll be seeking to advance the development of the priorities that have been identified in our technology strategy and which you've heard about today. As the strategy highlights, aerospace is at a pivotal moment and the entire ecosystem will need to transform to enable the adoption of these new technologies. This will need significant investment, but also unprecedented collaboration and radical innovation. And the ATI is here to help the UK aerospace sector to meet this challenge. Please do get in touch if you'd like to discuss our strategy or how we can work together. We'd really welcome your questions, your feedback and your ideas. And I'd now like to hand over to Sophie to introduce the panel. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sophie Lane. I'm the Chief Relationships Officer at the ATI. Um, and I get the fun job this morning of asking the questions. So hopefully um, the presentations you've had have whetted your appetite. Um, and now we're going to delve a bit deeper into some of the details around the strategy and its delivery. Uh, and I want to start with you, Simon, if I may. So the strategy is, is clearly focused on sustainability and the achievement of the net zero 2050 target. But how far is the ATI actually able to influence the hitting of that target? Uh, I think enormously. Uh, what we're trying to ensure is that we're, we're investing a, a, across a broad range of technologies to address sustainability, because I guess as uh, a favorite saying is there's no silver bullet. Uh, to the problem you need you need to invest broadly and the, the really powerful thing about investing in technology is that our technologies will end up in global products and those products um, operate across the world and so the impact is not just in the uk uh, but thanks to the competitive competitiveness of our supply chain all of those technologies yeah, will be in global products and will benefit emissions on a global basis so that's a really powerful thing I think I think the other um, point I'd like to make is that um, we are uh, addressing, if you like, the aircraft that fly in the air transport system. There are a lot of other parts, obviously. There's the uh, way in which you manage the air traffic system itself, the airports, the infrastructure, all of those things, um, all have got their contribution to make uh, to a much more sustainable future. We interact with all of those and, and particularly important in the scheme of things is the ATI's uh, commitment and engagement with the Jet Zero Council. And again, the Jet Zero Council is, is providing a real focus for all the different uh, groups uh, and interest groups around the aviation ecosystem uh, and getting it all focused and, and in harmony on how we're going to get to uh, net zero by 2050. Thanks, Sophie. Thank you. Um, Mark, I'd like to ask you uh, a question about um, efficiencies and weight reduction. You talked about those in your presentation, but can you explain how they actually benefit sustainability? Absolutely. <clears throat> Thanks, Sophie. Um, <clears throat> I guess the, the, the first thing I'll bring, bring us back to what's, what Simon was talking about earlier with sustainable aviation fuel. So a large proportion of uh, the future fleet will be consuming sustainable aviation fuel. So that's one of the measures towards decarbonisation. Clearly, we need to minimise the amount of that sustainable aviation fuel, which is a uh, an, you know, very expensive and finite resource. So how do we ensure that we really minimise um, the, the carbon consequence of that uh, is going to be really important. So all of the benefits that we talked about earlier in the ultra efficient roadmap in terms of driving down weight and uh, improving efficiency are going to be so critical. And I guess the, the other thing as well, if you kind of think about all of the ultra efficient technologies, really lay themselves into uh, supporting the adoption of future zero carbon uh, technologies as well. So you really want an ultra efficient platform, which you can then put some of the zero carbon technologies into. So it's a combination of these technologies that going forward that really drive that maximum uh, benefit in terms of decarbonisation. Thanks, Sophie. OK, and, and given the focus on sustainability, um, Alejandro, why aren't you just focusing on zero carbon? Why are we focusing more broadly? Uh, well, we're focusing on reaching net zero and net zero is a combination of different uh, technological approaches. So as Mark said, 
we have the ultra efficient technologies which will reduce the amount of fuel we use whichever fuel there is we have the zero carbon technologies that will eliminate the carbon at the tailpipe like uh, hydrogen or batteries uh, and uh, all of these together we will contribute towards reaching net zero so it is not one or the other it's uh, going to be a combination of all of them Okay, so you're looking at um, developments in combination really across the different areas. So, so Alex, from your perspective, how is, how is cross-cutting supporting this? So cross-cutting is uh, another route to achieving um, lightweight and, and high-performance structures, um, but whilst also uh, ensuring that the UK remains competitive because uh, in order to be able to produce these, work, uh, the, these products and services that are used globally, we need to be competitive. And, and part of that is ensuring that uh, we, we have the best methods uh, for producing um, uh, lightweight products uh, efficiently with the minimal material uh, and minimal energy and, and emissions associated with producing them such that you're, you're impacting uh, the manufacturing as well as the through life operations of the aircraft uh, with, with cost competitive uh, products. That, that's one of the key things. The other, the other is having the um, manufacturing and, and simulation capabilities to make, uh, to make very lightweight, uh, efficient uh, products at large scale and at high rate, uh, which is ensuring that we've got um, manufacturing industrial systems uh, and, the, and the digitally connected supply chain, digital twins that are evolving and maturing uh, those products to uh, be able to deliver them uh, a robust product for the end customers um, at the right price. Okay, so we're talking about uh, kind of physical technologies, we're talking about uh, ways of manufacture, we're talking about uh, how we do things, systems, it really is across the board then. So um, Alejandro, I, I I heard you talk about batteries very briefly, and I saw in the scope uh, that we talked a little bit about eVTOL, but the majority of the focus within the um, strategy seems to be on on hydrogen and, and SAF. Why, why are we not focusing on the battery technologies that um, already exist and are being developed? Um, yeah, it's a good question. We, we do have a section uh, that has battery included there, <clears throat> but we have, uh, we, we recognize that to be able to decarbonize large commercial aircraft, uh, we will need something more than batteries. The reason being that the amount of energy you can store in a battery is quite limited. So we would need a very large weight of batteries to be able to power large commercial aircraft. And as Simon said in his presentation, most of the emissions are coming from large narrow body and wide body aircraft. So if we really want to decarbonize that, then we need to focus on things beyond batteries. Batteries is something that is going to help us, but for the very small range of the of the spectrum. So EVTOLs, VTOLs, perhaps small regionals, uh, but the large amount of, of emissions will come from the larger aircraft. And for those, uh, we need to decarbonize using uh, hydrogen, which has a higher uh, energy density than kerosene and with SAF, which will uh, compensate for the emissions over its life cycle. Okay, and is that because um, of the capacity of batteries to be able to fund the bigger aircraft or is that to do with weight? Why is it that you transfer over to hydrogen round about the regional uh, size? Yeah, that's that's exactly it. So uh, <clears throat> the, the issue with batteries is that one kilogram of batteries can hold about one eightieth of the energy that you can hold in one kilogram of kerosene. So if you want to, to fly further or if you want to carry a larger load, so more passengers, then you need to have more and more batteries, which will end up being so heavy that for a larger aircraft, you, you just wouldn't even be able to, to take off. So that, that is the issue with, with batteries. It's about how much energy we are able to store in one kilogram of, of batteries. Okay, thank you. That makes absolute sense. So if I ask you um, a question across the board, um, one of Simon's initial slides talked about the aim of the strategy being to uh, maximise 
uh, opportunities for the UK. Um, and so where do you see opportunities for UK industry and the supply chain over the next five years? Um, and maybe Simon, if I start with you, and then I will ask um, uh, each of the technologists to, to give a view on that as well. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you know, looking, uh, you know, initially at the traditional strengths of the UK, uh, we're really strong on uh, things like jet engines, uh, uh, now composite structures, large structures, uh, and uh, some of the key systems that go onto aircraft. And you know, that's that's where the market certainly is over the next five years. Um, but we need to be ready for the potential new markets brought on by um, zero carbon emission aircraft. And, and you know, particularly uh, we're looking at uh, the opportunities uh, for supply chain companies in the areas of cryogenics. Um, so as uh, you, people may know, um, to use hydrogen to, to get out to long ranges of aircraft, uh, you need to convert it to liquid hydrogen, which only exists at very, very low temperatures. This is a whole new area of technology. Uh, but one of, the th one of the things I, you know, thankfully, is that you, the UK does have um, some knowledge and experience in that area, both in the space industry um, and in the, um, the, 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 the sort of um, exotic, more exotic areas of science of um, uh, things like fusion uh, research and so on, where they're they're bringing through. Um, superconducting systems at, at, at ultra low temperatures sort of thing you get with liquid hydrogen. Uh, so there is some expertise there. And I, I, you know, I certainly believe that we can develop wholly new supply chains out of that uh, in those, uh, those new and exciting areas. Okay. And if I just turn to Mark, from your perspective, um, what are the opportunities within your area for the UK supply chain? So, so in terms of the ultra efficient area, I think um, certainly a, there's a lot still a huge amount to play for there. If you look at the, the different technologies that I've talked about earlier. So if we look at the uh, UHBR engine capability, clearly that's delivered by one of uh, by Rolls Royce, but that is not delivered in entirety by Rolls Royce. There's a huge supply chain requirement in terms of some of the component technologies, some of the supporting capabilities that are required to deliver that in the future in terms of product technology. So we're anticipating um, quite a quite a big uh, push in terms of that supply chain development as we as we look to mature that technology over the coming years. If we also I also mentioned uh, propeller technologies, which are really there for some of the uh, smaller aircraft. Uh, clearly, the UK has a world leading propeller capability. And we see that expanding across uh, a number of new aircraft. Uh, so there's some, clearly some opportunities there. Then if we look across systems, systems really is made up of many of the supply chain companies in the UK. Uh, and and the, typically we, we see lots of examples there. I, I could name a few, but thermal management is going to be a key one. Uh, and then there's whole kinds of capabilities that we've really alluded to as part of that roadmap. And then when we look at the area structures, uh, lots of uh, opportunities there supporting industrialization of these new uh, composite high aspect ratio wing technologies. Uh, whether it's in the supply chain supporting the industrialization or whether it's in the some of the testing activities that's required to support that, all kinds of uh, big opportunities across the whole supply chain there. Thank you. And Alejandro, I mean, Simon talked a bit about uh, cryogenics, but you had um, a number of entry into service dates um, for zero carbon aircraft. What, what areas do you think there are opportunities for the UK to be able to be um, putting their technology onto those aircraft? Yeah, thank you. So I think uh, some of those areas have been mentioned by, by someone and Mark. So we talk about uh, combustion capabilities. We talk about cryogenics. Uh, I think, a, um, well, I want to answer two things. One is a good opportunity for the UK is that when we look at liquid hydrogen usage, especially for aircraft, there are uh infrastructure and capabilities that that don't exist in the uk but they don't exist anywhere in the world so that's a good opportunity for the uk to position itself uh, as a leader in all of these technologies and when it comes to accelerating things i think that we have a lot to learn from both uh, other sectors which are already using hydrogen today to transport passengers like uh, 
transporting passengers on buses, cars, trains, etc. Uh, so we can learn a lot from them to be able to implement in aviation and accelerate and bring these dates further ahead. But we can also learn from things that are happening here in the UK. So we are already funding companies that are testing hydrogen on small aircraft, uh, including generation infrastructure uh, and so on. There are compa uh, companies and universities in the UK that are already experimenting on burning hydrogen. So we can learn a lot from what is happening here to be able to direct uh, our efforts and accelerate those dates. Thank you. And Harry, what are we doing to be able to um, get out and engage with the supply chain to make sure they're aware of these opportunities? Yeah, well, as you said, it is about um, getting out there. It's about getting out and about and uh, and, and talking to the supply chain. So um, we're about to kick off a, a series of regional road shows. So I think I'm in the, the Northwest later this week and, um, and the Midlands next week. And I know um, colleagues are um, planning a number of additional trips uh, beyond that as well. So those are really an opportunity uh, to get out and talk to people about our technology strategy, um, engage with the supply chain uh, on the various different opportunities that we have for, for funding and, and other support and, uh, and establishing that dialogue, which I think is, uh, is going to be so important. Um, as Alejandro just said, you know, some of these are technologies that don't exist yet. Um, so it's, it, it's going to be exceptionally important to, to engage and start that dialogue. So um, there are the roadshows coming up, uh, which I think should be, uh, should be great. I also mentioned earlier when I was talking um, some of the activities that we're trying to um, launch in relation to innovation. So we will be holding a number of different workshops, uh, potentially some, some challenge-led activities that will bring together uh, both some of the, the, the larger players in the sector, but also the SMEs and the, the startups uh, to again, engage on, on some of these topics. I think I also talked about uh, NATEP, so that's a great opportunity to engage the, the supply chain um, and to fund some, some important technology development uh, projects as well. Um, and just our, our, our broader role within the, uh, the sector, uh, the, the advisory networks that we have and the, the role that we can play in engaging bilaterally with, uh, with companies. Uh, I think I, I said at the end of uh, my, my slot earlier, you know, please do get in touch. I think we're all um, here to, to have the right sort of conversations um, around how we can take some of these priority areas forward. Um, so it's about the ATI playing a, an open, collaborative and, and convening role, I think. And, and as you said, getting out and about. Excellent, thank you. And presumably to find out about those challenge-led initiatives, um, that will be people coming to our website and, and looking out for um, communication uh, via our social media. Yeah, absolutely. I think anything that we do will go up on the, the website and uh, we'll, we'll try and be pretty active in, in how we publicise some of these things coming up. Brilliant. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Alex, we um, we talked about cross-cutting technologies um, underpinning all of these uh, sustainable technologies that we're developing. In, in your view, what do you think are going to be the most influential changes um, we're going to see in that area? And, and how do you think UK companies are placed to take advantage of those uh, changes? So um, the, the technologies that support light lighting that I mentioned previously are, are, are pretty key. Um, enable efficient manufacturing of, of the future systems. Um, but key material developments are, are absolutely going to be required um, to achieve some of these new products and services. Uh, and they provide an opportunity for UK uh, supply chain to engage as well as the broader ecosystem, so academia and RTOs, develop and mature and then industrialise those capabilities, making sure that they make technical and commercial sense. Um, uh, we can be a part of then linking those organisations uh, into the OEMs and tier ones to help sort of demonstrate their capabilities, get a pull on the technology, uh, and, and then support them through the ATI funded programs, um, mature and de-risk them, uh, ready for those those next opportunities. There's a lot of opportunity there. We are seeing quite a lot of innovation and, and disruption in, in terms of um, technologies being created by, by smaller businesses. 
uh, and, and the, the broader industry that we want to make sure are, are being developed here in the UK. There's also a lot of opportunity to bring work into the UK where we're currently going overseas. We've, we've done a lot of work around uh, tooling uh, and put out a tooling directory and, and webinars around this. We want to create the opportunities for the UK to create uh, those future um, uh, tools in the R&D, but also for um, production of future aircraft not just for civil, but there will obviously be opportunities in, in defence and other areas where um, those companies can get the returns for their investment. Thank you, Alex. And I know that we've got a, a joining webinar uh, coming up on the 10th of May as well. So hopefully um, plenty of people will be able to join us for that. Um, in terms of the launch of this strategy, Harry, what does it mean for applications to our program sure well i, I should say um the strategic program is uh, is currently open for expressions of interest um so the the EO, EO, eoi stage opened on the 4th of april um and actually closes on the the 27th of april uh with the four stage competition opening on the 30th of may as i said details are on the website but then there are going to be opportunities for expressions of interest in uh, batch 38 that's the next batch uh, from june july and august uh, of this year and we're going to be using the tech technology strategy as a starting point in our prioritization there so i think i mentioned earlier you know we're in a, a position where there's a lot of demand for funding a lot of areas that need to be uh, funded and making sure that we use this for prioritization is going to be absolutely key along with some of the other um other measures that I mentioned, things like environmental impact, market impact, um, and the, the sort of balance of, of risk, TRL, uh, and company sizes within that portfolio of, of investments. So I think the, the launch of the strategy is, uh, is a really important enabler uh, of, of success within the uh, ATI strategic program. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and I guess, uh, the question a lot of people will want to understand, Simon, is how are you actually going to measure the success of the strategy? We talked a little bit about targets against each of the um, uh, roadmaps, but I mean, obviously, these are huge targets, um, assuming the adoption of uh, all of this technology. So, so how do you think you're going to measure success? Uh, well, a key thing for us is uh, uh, from the technical community is is setting those milestones of technical delivery, uh, and um, you will see against each of the roadmap sections, uh, there are some clear targets, technical targets we're trying to achieve, uh, and some of them are nearer term, some of them are longer term. Uh, you know, some of the examples from the next five years, and I've already talked about some of these. For example, is we we expect. Um, the ultra high bypass ratio turbofan technologies to achieve first engine run this year. So that'll be a key milestone for us. We've already seen um, aircraft flying with ATI funded technology. We expect to see more of those flying uh, over the next uh, two to three years, uh, in fact. So those would be clear milestones. We expect the um, ultra high bypass ratio turbofan to fly within the next five years. Um, future composite wing technology, we expect to see full up uh, prototype wing assemblies again within the next five years. And then uh, in the areas uh, around hydrogen propulsion, we, uh, we've already talked about, we, we've got a range of projects already in train there. Uh, and uh, we expect some of those coming to um, demonstration in the next five years. And I'd also want to see uh, new infrastructure being built uh, within that five-year timescale to allow scale-up of uh, hydrogen propulsion uh, technologies, uh, in particular the um, science and technology behind hydrogen combustion. Thank you. And so from your perspective, Mark, can you let me know, you know, this is a sector strategy. What does good look like from your perspective in five years' time? So uh, building a little bit on what Simon was describing there, I, I think the key thing here is about really demonstrating technology readiness level six on those key technologies. The UK has to have those technologies truly demonstrated such that they can be selected for the next future opportunities uh, in terms of 
new platforms and new engine opportunities. So that's that for me. That's the super critical thing, and that that needs a concerted effort from across the whole community, industry, academia, the RTOs, everybody to really deliver against the the things that we've got in our roadmap there, and, and demonstrating TRL six and and the equivalent in terms of manufacturing readiness level. Thank you. Okay, and just to turn that round a little bit, then. So, what are the challenges? Uh, that you foresee. Um, so there, there are plenty of challenges. Still, still a lot to play for with all of all of these technologies. Uh, if we if we look at um, the propulsion technologies, uh, still uh, a lot to do there in terms of really de-risking and, and demonstrating that the ultra high bypass ratio concept will deliver all of those benefits that were really uh, targeted as part of the strategy. Um, we have every uh, indication from the work that's been that's taken place so far that we're in good shape to progress towards that. But the the real proof of that is going to be uh, through the next phase of of testing uh, and delivery of some of that work. If we look in the world of systems, some of the big challenges there in the world of systems are really about um, how to accommodate some of the uh, delivery of some of the advanced lightweight composite, uh, not composite. Um, uh, compact solutions that will fit within these novel uh, high aspect high aspect ratio wings, um, and but not not just within the wings, but also you know the larger system structures such as landing gear uh, and some of those systems, which really will need to have fundamental technology changes to to kind of drive down significant amount of weight reduction. So lots to play for on those. And if we look at industrialization of these novel wings, some, some big work to do there in terms of really proving that these are can be can be delivered ultimately in a future product. Uh, so a lot to do in terms of the manufacturing readiness across the board there. Okay, thank you. And Alejandro, from your perspective on the zero carbon, um, obviously we're talking about uh, more immature technology. Um, what do you think good looks like in five years' time? So I'll, I'll, I can tell you what my wish list is, um, but if you look at the at the roadmap, we have specific milestones there, and I think what good look like good looks like on the propulsion side uh, within the five years, if we have a hydrogen fuel cell flight demonstrator, preferably with liquid hydrogen storage, that that would be a good milestone. Uh, if we have and Simon, Simon just mentioned it, ground demonstrator of a, of a gas turbine combusting hydrogen. That's something we need to do as well in the next five years. Uh, with regards to systems, I think we need to advance our heat exchanger capabilities. So it would be really good to be able to have uh, physical demonstrators on the ground of, of heat exchangers and, and hydrogen, liquid hydrogen fuel systems. And with uh, aerodynamics, uh, we need to demonstrate dry wings, so wind tunnel testings of dry wings, cryogenic materials, high temperature materials. So all of these uh, te uh, technologies, milestones and demonstrators would need to accelerate and happen within the next five years for us to be able to deliver the aircraft at the time that we, we expect them to be within the mid thirties. Okay. And, and Alex, from your perspective, do you think um, in order to hit the kind of uh, um, targets that that Mark and Alejandro have set out um, are the is the cross cutting sector in the right place to be able to support that. So there's a lot of uh, infrastructure investments that have happened over the course of time that create some real world leading capability. Um, we've seen that demonstrated on programs like Wing of Tomorrow. Uh, that there's a great uh, foundation to build on. There's a lot of lessons learned that have come out from that, and there's a lot of ideas on how that could be uh, evolved um, to, to further enhance those uh, capabilities for making some of um, the large structures at a very high rate um, uh, composite and, and metallic manufacturing. Um, to do that, we also need the design analysis tools to be able to design these future products. So they need to be mature in parallel. Um, because these, these products are getting ever more um, complex in terms of structures. 
Um, but we also need to not just design them, but also certify them and compress them time frame. So, so those tools are going to be key. Many of the technologies developing are going to need to narrow in on um, because a lot of people are backing a lot of horses at the moment, but we need to make sure that we're funding the technologies that is, is going to um, win the competition for getting onto those uh, platform and, and get certified because we're interested in getting the technology flying. Um, so working with the OEMs and tier ones to make sure that we're, we're focused on those right technologies, also the supporting supply chain that's part of um, innovating and delivering those. Um, we also want to make sure we're developing uh, the technology cost effectively, link, working with academia and RTOs, but not doing that in isolation, working with uh, uh, extensive and very capable supply chain that's here so that the capabilities that have been developed um, are there with the supply chain, um, part of the development, ready to take that on and industrialize it for those future products and services. So it's working um, uh, smartly, effectively, collaboratively to create uh, and build on the, the great capabilities and uh, supply chain that we've got in the, uh, the UK already. Thank you. And uh, I mean, I take your point, you know, this is not something that the ATI is going to fund in isolation. You know, there's obviously investments needed uh, elsewhere across the sector. And um, Simon, you know, you were very clear about where the ATI uh, program scope is, um, but actually meeting your targets looks like it's going to be a whole ecosystem effort. So, so where do you see um, challenges across the ecosystem that ATI is going to have to engage with in order to to move forward towards the success of this strategy? Um, <clears throat> immediate and close to home to deliver technology, we need the right infrastructure. And some of that will benefit other sectors, not just aerospace. Uh, and you might be looking into the auto, uh, automotive sector and other transport sectors, for example, but, but there are others, for example, who, who may uh, wish to uh, apply and, and make use of hydrogen. So uh, that will need a certain amount of infrastructure in place to, to be able to do the experiments and, and, and demonstrations uh, going forward. Uh, but then moving outwards, uh, you, you start to think about um, the areas such as airports. Uh, clearly, um, aircraft uh, of the future will either need to take on board SAF or they'll need to take on board hydrogen and um, both of those have their own particular infrastructure requirements um, which will require um, sustained and, and coordinated investment uh, from the airport sector uh, and then out further again is is the energy supply into airports the fuel supplies um, so you know how will we get SAF uh, to airports in the future, which is it, which is a potentially new supply chain that needs to be kept under some circumstances discreet uh, from conventional kerosene, and then uh, out to hydrogen, which is a wholly new infrastructure. So we need to ensure that we're working with um, all of the players who are delivering the full aerospace uh, picture. Uh, along with uh, organizations such as NATS, uh, who are obviously looking at the future of controlling aircraft uh, more efficiently in airspace, and um, the Civil Aviation Authority, uh, who are concerned with the regulation, the future regulations that are going to enable those new technologies as well. So we, we need to make sure that um, you know, we're clear on the technologies that we're delivering and the scope of that, but then also very closely coordinating with all the other bodies that are required to deliver the aviation system of the future. Okay, so this is a uh, cross-sector uh, challenge, really. Um, and yeah. Harry, um, we heard earlier that, um, particularly in the zero carbon area, um, there is a huge immaturity, but also an immaturity globally. So how, um, how does ATI um, think that they're going to engage in that kind of global discussion? Yeah, absolutely. As, as you say, you know, things are in their very, very early days. And perhaps just to build on the uh, point that Simon was making about the infrastructure there, you know, that that broad requirement for infrastructure will bring with it a need for, for some very patient capital. And there's a real challenge around um, the balance between supply and demand, if you think about um, sort of on the one hand, the energy producers uh, who 
need the confidence in the uptake of new fuels at an economic level uh, to justify uh, and at the volumes needed to justify their investment in bringing down the the cost uh, of, uh, of production and supply. And on the other hand, from a demand perspective, you'll need um, from the airlines, for example, a, a confidence in the viability of the technology, but also confidence in the availability of uh, supply of fuels, again, at an economic level. So there's a real need for, for dialogue between them. Uh, and, and there's a real need for, for dialogue in a number of other areas as well. And that has to be done at a global level. Uh, you know the aerospace market and the aviation market, as we know, is a, is a very uh, a very global market indeed. Uh, and at the ATI, I think we we have a, a role to play there in collaborating and talking to uh, not just our our international um, partners and and uh, a number of different international organisations, but also, as Simon mentioned just now, a number of organisations uh, that sort of sit beyond the the, the core aerospace market. Um, and uh, include the likes of energy providers, airlines, airports, infrastructure providers. Um, and through our, through our network, through our advisory groups, I think we're in a position to do that, to try and um, address some of these challenges and, and move the conversation along. Thank you. And I think um, it's important also to recognise that, um, you know, where ATI sits is that we've talked a lot about industry today, uh, but we also work very closely uh, with government um, and uh, looking forward to um, some of the results of the consultations that have been held recently um, and indeed the Jet Zero strategy uh, that will hopefully be launched later this summer that will um, uh, align and hopefully give us some support in these areas and, and help move the ecosystem forward. So I'd like to thank you all for your time um, and for the great work that you've done uh, on this strategy. Uh, hopefully, uh, for those of you who are listening, um, you have uh, found a number of things within the strategy uh, that you'd like to find out more about. Please engage with the ATI. Uh, we will have a number of uh, sessions uh, coming up shortly. Uh, we will also have our virtual conference on the 9th of June uh, which I would um, uh, love for you to sign up to. Um, and please uh, read the strategy, give us your thoughts, engage with us. Uh, this is a sector strategy and it's really important to us uh, that we get your feedback and that we understand how we can take this forward together. Thank you very much for your time.